Today I want to explain epigenetics, what it is and how you can use it to improve your health and overall well-being. This video is meant as a practical guide for beginners, but it will also offer new insights if you're already familiar with the basics of epigenetic optimization. Let's get started. Okay, so the term epigenetics is kind of a buzzword in health circles. So what does it even mean? Epi comes from the Greek word for above or upon. And genetics is the study of your genes and DNA. Together, the term epigenetics means anything related to your gene activity that does not involve changing the DNA itself. That's still a little technical, so an even more pragmatic definition would be how your genes are turned on or off based on your environment and lifestyle choices. The reason epigenetics is so interesting is because before it was introduced, the central idea among researchers was genetic determinism. So you had your DNA that was a mix of your parents' DNA, which then determined how your cells and body would function. The research would focus mostly on identifying specific genes or DNA strands and then determining their function or linking them to specific diseases. Genetic determinism basically means that there's very little that you can actively do to change how your DNA behaves beyond obvious mutations. But epigenetics change this. So even though you can't really change your DNA, you can influence how your body reads that DNA. So instead of trying to fix the hardware, you can try to change the software. This view opened up countless possibilities to study how our environment, the food we eat, and the stress we are under influence our health. It's an amazing field of study because it allows people who've been dealt a bad hand in terms of genetics to still improve their odds of enjoying good health. Teaching you the basics of how to do this is what I want to do in this video. We will cover the most important epigenetic factors and I will give you tips on how to improve them. I will start by giving you general health advice that is always beneficial to epigenetic improvement. We will talk about lifestyle, nutrition, and environmental exposure. This will be the standard protocol that builds the foundation. Later in the video, I will also show you how you can customize that approach through testing and things like finding out your methylation type. But let's first start off with my standard epigenetic protocol. Like I said before, there are three main factors that influence gene expression. So how your genes are read by your body. Lifestyle, nutrition slash dieting, and environmental exposure. We will go through them one by one, starting with your lifestyle. How you lead your day-to-day -day life is extremely important for gene regulation. For example, the glucocorticoid receptor gene NR3C1 is heavily influenced by stress. Chronic stress can lead to increased methylation of this gene, which leads to a longer stress response and an increased risk of anxiety and depression. Because stress also negatively affects many other genes, most lifestyle improvements that will help your epigenetic profile focus on stress reduction. The general advice is usually along the lines of choosing a healthier work-life balance, getting more and better quality sleep, regular physical activity while not overdoing it either, and a solid social circle that offers support during the ups and downs of life. All of this is definitely important, but I feel like it's common sense. So for me personally, more practical advice was to learn active relaxation. Unlike passive relaxation where you just do nothing, active relaxation has you relax, but still engage your body and mind. There are different ways you can do this, for example, through progressive muscle relaxation, autogenic training, or my favorite technique, meditation. Vagus nerve activation has also grown in popularity in recent years, as have certain health tech devices like VNS devices that help you achieve even better vagus nerve stimulation through mild pulses of electrical energy. The goal of all these strategies is to reduce sympathetic dominance and activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is that branch of your autonomic nervous system that is responsible for rest, digestion and recovery. Which of the strategies you choose doesn't really matter as long as you do it regularly and get good at it. Because regularly activating your parasympathetic nervous system branch is key to curing many chronic conditions. And it's actually priority number one of my own recovery program. I teach it to all of my students. This brings me to the second epigenetic factor, nutrition and dieting. Why is it important? 
Well, because obviously a healthy diet promotes a healthy body. I don't need to tell you that. A diet full of unprocessed or minimally processed foods provides a lot of vitamins, minerals, and other essential nutrients that our body needs to run properly. In terms of improving your epigenetics, one key factor of many nutrients is their ability to reduce oxidative stress and inflammation. For example, chronic inflammation that isn't kept in check can lead to changes in the IL-6 gene, which plays a key role in regulating inflammation and the immune response through interleukin-6 proteins. Another very important aspect of your nutrition is methylation and how your diet can affect it. Methylation is the addition of a methyl group to your DNA. It's kind of like a bookmark. And depending on whether you add or subtract a methyl group to your DNA, it gets read differently. We will talk about it in more detail later in the video because it does get very important when you want to customize your epigenetic protocol. The third key factor I want to talk about and that everyone needs to be aware of is your environmental exposure. This is important because in our modern world, we're constantly surrounded by toxins and pollutants. These include heavy metals, microplastics, endocrine disruptors, so substances that mess with your hormones, and other molecules that interfere with your metabolism. For example, heavy metals such as mercury can block enzyme function, so these enzymes don't work at optimal capacity, they can increase oxidative stress, they can replace essential nutrients in your body, and they can even negatively affect your DNA in terms of cancer. For example, one study showed that people in New Hampshire who were chronically exposed to arsenic showed a DNA silencing of genes that are thought to be important for keeping bladder cancer in check. Now, there are several ways in which you can improve your environment to reduce the negative effect these toxins have on you. The most obvious is, of course, to reduce toxin exposure. This includes things like using aluminum-free deodorants, limiting the sources of microplastics and bisphenols around you, and to avoid heavy metals as much as possible. Another important step is to optimize your drinking water. This is a rabbit hole in and of itself that I talk about in a different video in more detail. And lastly, and this is probably the most important, you want to improve your body's ability to eliminate toxins effectively. This includes improving your liver and kidney health, which are the primary elimination organs, and getting enough of the nutrients necessary for detoxification. I also have a video dedicated to this topic. It is very important, and almost every chronic fatigue student I have has issues here. Other ways to improve your detoxification include things like sauna or dry brushing. These are more lifestyle improvements or even hobbies if you want to call it that, but they definitely help. I just don't want to overload you with information, so take it slow and see what works best for you and where you want to start. For anyone who's watching this video because they want to recover from things like chronic fatigue or a similar condition, I generally recommend a four-step healing roadmap that you can find in my recovery program. It includes all the things we talked about so far, but prioritizes them according to the impact they will have on your healing journey and tells you which to do first, second, and so forth. Great, now that we talked about this general epigenetic protocol, how can you customize it? This is where testing comes into play and where things can get complicated. There are two main ways in which you can customize a program towards your own genetic profile. The most common is to get a gene test to find out the individual genotypes slash gene variations that you might have in your DNA. I got mine from a British testing institute and you mail in your saliva and they send you your results after about two weeks. It was basically a long list of specific genes, my genotype, and the genotype that was linked to higher risks of certain conditions. When mine and the high-risk genotype matched, it was indicated in red. Other testing institutions will have different layouts, but the basic underlying idea is always the same. You would then take this list and ideally together with a practitioner would go through it to see if there are ways through nutrition or supplementation to account for these gene variations. Probably the most well-known example is the MTHFR gene. It encodes an enzyme called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase that breaks down the harmful amino acid homocysteine. People with a variation in this gene can have lower than optimal functioning of this enzyme and they're often told to take methylfolate instead of folic acid, which is the bioactive form of folate, 
so the enzyme doesn't have to work as much and can already use the bioactive nutrient. This brings me back to methylation, which we already talked about before. It's usually what practitioners will focus on most when they go through your genetic report. Besides MTHFR, other relevant genes include MTR, MTRR, AHCY, COMT, and others. These genes give instructions on how exactly your body's methylation works, so where and how it adds methyl groups to other molecules. And this doesn't just have to be DNA. Methylation is also involved in neurotransmitters, hormones, and energy production. It's such a critical process that some people even use the terms epigenetics and methylation almost as synonyms, even though they technically aren't. Now, the problem with this standard approach of going through the individual genes and trying to see how you can account for them through supplementation, for example, is that they all work together and it's not just the ones that I just listed, there are many others. Often you don't know where to start and which gene variation to focus on. I remember one practitioner writing that it feels like playing 4D underwater chess. For that reason, at least for beginners, I found it to be more helpful to try to test the net effect of all genes working together. My favorite protocol for this is the Walsh protocol, which I review in a different video. It was designed for mental health patients, but in practice, it's also helpful for other conditions. Instead of testing your genes, you test whole blood histamine, which is broken down through methylation. So you use whole blood histamine as a proxy for the net effect of your methylation genes working together. Depending on your results, you're categorized as a normal methylator, an overmethylator, or an undermethylator. Undermethylators don't methylate enough, while overmethylators methylate too much. To put this in epigenetic terms, and again because the Walsh protocol focuses mostly on mental health, in undermethylators, the genes for neurotransmitter reuptake are too active. This means their neurotransmitter levels are too low, leading to things like low serotonin depression. Because methylation inactivates these genes, you need to upregulate it and give methyl donors through your diet and supplements to silence the neurotransmitter reuptake genes. Examples would include the amino acid methionine, SAMe, and TMG. In overmethylators, you have the opposite problem. So the genes for neurotransmitter reuptake are not active enough and they need to be downregulated. You do this through nutrients that promote acetylation of histones, which is kind of the opposite of methylation because it activates genes. Examples would include vitamin B3, vitamin B9, and B12. As a beginner, you don't necessarily need to understand every last detail here. All I wanted to show you was that there are two routes you can go down. One, which is the route most practitioners choose, is to look at every gene variation you have and try to account for it individually, and two, to estimate the net effect of your genes working together, and then to classify you as an under, normal, or over methylator. One last thing I wanted to mention before I end this video, I found that the more you focus on the fundamentals that we talked about in the beginning of the video, so general improvements in your lifestyle, nutrition, and environment, the less individual gene variations seem to matter. At least that's my experience, and studies seem to confirm it. There are certain parts of the world where specific gene variations are more common, but if the people living there lead low stress and healthy lives, the illnesses thought to be associated with the gene variations are not more common. One practical example would be that of Southern Italy, where women are much more likely to have an MTHFR gene variation, but they're not much more likely to have the illnesses and health problems associated with it. So go slow and take everything one step at a time. Please don't stress yourself out over epigenetics. That would be the last thing I wanted to achieve with this guide. I hope you liked this video and I will see you in the next one.